Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, what's in the news? There's a lot in the news. Uh, the Texas State Department of Health is now reporting a confirmed case of measles. Uh, it's in uh, Hood County. Uh, the last confirmed case was in 2019. And this is a young child, has no history of travel. Um, uh, and, you know, so <laughs> obviously measles is around and it's very infectious. If you remember when we did our numbers, the R number for COVID when it started was like two and a half got up to 10 with all the mutations, and measles is 18. So it's the most infectious respiratory disease around. And so not surprisingly, when people don't get vaccinated, the first one that appears uh, is measles. So as of June of this year, there have been 16 cases reported in the US. So we had a giant outbreak in 2019, as you can see, but 16 cases already, and the year's not over. So that's a real issue, uh, again, one of the one of the problems when people start being negative about vaccinations is, and they don't vaccinate their kids, uh, you get measles outbreak. It, it, I, we talked about this before in in Marin County in California. One of the reasons they did so well with COVID was because after they did so poorly with measles, they had a real campaign to get everybody vaccinated uh, in Marin County. So in the world, China still remains the hot spot for for COVID. Uh, the big concern, of course, as one of our uh, viewers pointed out, as long as there's replicating virus, uh, there's the opportunity for recombination. And so <laughs> we don't want another recombination event. Uh, right now, we're doing okay because the virus still remains pretty much the XBB, and I'll show you that in a second. For the first time in a while, I'm beginning to feel some, like things are getting better. So if you look at wastewater numbers across the country, only 38% this week are reporting increases of 100% uh, or more. Last week it was over 40%. If you look at uh, just detectable SARS-CoV-2 uh, in wastewater, it's still a lot of red dots all over the country, but it's actually fewer. And if you look at the percent change in the last 15 days, it's uh, fewer and fewer places that are reporting uh, over 1,000% or more increase. So mostly in the Midwest, but that's getting better. Some in upstate New York, along the Atlantic coast, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, and then in Colorado. But generally, this is actually looking better. The dominant strains, 99%, are XBB related. It's XBB 1.5, XBB 1.16, and some variants. The main thing about that is that if you've gotten XBB, you're probably going to be res resistant to these variants, as long as we don't have a recombination event. Now, the, the um, booster shot does not contain and the, the XBB um, spike protein. So I'm hopeful again in the fall we'll have a different bivalent or even a trivalent vaccine. So that's when I'll recommend that people start getting vaccinated, getting their second or even third booster. So I wanted to talk about something today I don't normally talk about. This is a really cool book, One Health Meets the Exposome. It was written by Marianne Ottinger and Colin Geiselman, friends of mine. Uh, and what the, I like what they uh, are trying to do because it, it's, it's a cool book with lots of data. But there has been this concept for a long time you know, in uh, both the animal world, veterinary medicine, and, and human medicine, that there's a, a, a con connection between all of them. Obviously, just like we're talking about SARS-CoV-2 passing between bats and other species to humans, that's true anytime humans start encroaching upon wildlife. And so there has been this concept for a long time that, you know, wildlife and humans and domestic animals are sort of interrelated in this weird, in this one ecosystem. Uh, and so depending upon what's going on in the wild, the closest we get to them by encroaching upon their terrain, the more likely we are to have uh, infectious diseases like viruses uh, go back and forth. And so that was what led to this one health concept, human health, animal health, et cetera. What I liked about what, uh, what they explain in this book is that it, they call it the expososome. So it's not only the one health concept, but uh, you know, you're in, throughout your entire life, you make decisions, you know, where you travel, the kinds of personal choices you have, the way you eat, the way you, you behave. And that's all part of the things you're exposed to in the world today. And as you start thinking about our exposure, there are more, if you look at the population of the world over the last 12,000 years, we're at 8 billion people. There are more people alive today than oh, there were for thousands of years on the entire planet. And if you look at the population density,
from 10,000 BCE where there was almost nobody to this is a population down this number of people per uh, square kilometer of land. You can see how it has dramatically changed so where we're encroaching more and more on what used to be, you know, just plain, you know, forest land. And there's a really interesting uh, uh, set of data in one in the one world data set, which is also in this book, about how humanity has destroyed so much of the world's forests. If you look at, you know, 10,000 years ago, the country was, or the world was 57% forests and 42% grasslands. It's now down to 38% forests and 14% grasslands, which means more and more often humans and our domesticated animals are getting in contact with wildlife. And what we've discovered is bats in particular are uh, home of many, many viruses. And, you know, it's a really interesting issue because we're going to continuously be exposed to viruses that are, are living in bats. And why bats? Well, they're, they're, they're actually the, one of the more diverse mammal species. They're the only mammals that fly. Uh, they're really interesting animals because they eat insects, fish, and fruit. They're only, we always talk about the vampire bats, there are only three that actually drink blood. Uh, the vampire bat, the hairy-legged uh, bat, and the white-winged vampire bat. Uh, they're amazing because they use uh, sonar detection to, to really, uh, you know, identify their prey. But people don't realize they, they pollinate many plants just like bees do. They disperse seeds throughout uh, for helping uh, the forest grow. And they are, as small animals, they live for a very long time, some up to 40 years. And they also have the world's smallest uh, mammal, which is the bumblebee bat at two grams. So they're really interesting. Now, just uh, let's talk about bats for a bit because it's really fascinating. Flying foxes are the largest bats, and these are these are big bats. They can have uh, a wingspan of almost uh, you know three, four, or five feet, uh, and can be 40 centimeters long. They generally are they generally eat fruit. I mean, they're they're not going <laughs> to bite you, but they are huge. These are huge bats, and if you look just to see the size of them compared to a human. They're, these are giant bats, and they tend to live in clusters in the forest and eat fruit. Uh, the world's smallest mammal is the bumblebee bat at just two grams. And then, of course, the one that we think is responsible for the coronavirus reservoirs is the horseshoe bat. And it's named the horseshoe bat because its nose looks like a horseshoe. Uh, and these, in particular, harbor a lot of bats. But there is a cute bat. It's called the hunter and white bat, which we'll show you a picture of. And I, by the way, the world's largest bat colony is the, in the Bracken Cave, which is located right out of San Antonio. Why are bats in, it's so connected to human diseases? So the issue that they're the only mammals that fly probably has really important implications. They live exceptionally long lives, I mentioned that, which is also really interesting. And they are not affected by the many, many coronaviruses that live in them. And they can host a surprisingly large number of really bad viruses, not only uh, the coronaviruses that cause SARS, but also the MERS epidemic. Uh, they also uh, have Marburg, Nipah, and Hendra viruses, but they don't seem to suffer any ill effects. And the question is always, why do bats not suffer these ill effects and yet harbor all these viruses? Well, one thing, you know, most scientists think flight probably has a big important part of it because they expend enormous amounts of energy and their body temperatures can get over 106 degrees while they're in flight, which is like having a serious fever in a human. And most viruses, that's one of the ways we fight viruses uh, intrinsically, is we develop a fever response, a febrile response, which suppresses viral reproduction. The other thing that's really interesting is over the lifespan, uh, it, with all this high temperature, there's a lot of damage to DNA, and in most cases in humans, we would develop a very strong immune response. And bats have figured out a way to dampen their immune response so that despite the damage to cells, they don't seem to respond to it. Well, that's one of the reasons why they don't seem to get inflammatory responses to coronavirus. And if you remember, one of the big problems with coronavirus is, was that it induces this big immune response in the lungs, and that was part of the problem, and immune response everywhere. Uh, we've talked about that. But they don't seem to get an immune response. And so, you know, they have modulated their immune system uh, to, 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 to try and prevent this immune uh, response to viruses. So there's, you know, you could understand if we knew more about how bats do this, we could probably figure out ways to treat coronaviruses better, figure out ways that they're using to suppress the virus. We could probably create medicines out of that. So there's a really cool project called the Bat1K Project, which is to create 
high quality gen genomes for all the bat species. So the idea is to do like the, the, all of us study in humans, but the same in bats, which is to sequence, do whole genome sequencing of all the different uh, bat varieties. Now there are 1,400 species uh, in total, so that's going to be a, quite an undertaking. But the main goal is to try and get as many of these genomes possible. And in the first phase of the BAT1K project, uh, they're going to try and get 21 families of these bats uh, to start off. But eventually what the idea is to get all the other species sequenced. And we will get information uh, that's really interesting ways to, to treat potentially uh, once we get that information from uh, doing sequencing of the bats. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. The first is uh, Dr. Kara Marshall, the Assistant Professor of Neuroscience and a McNair Scholar at Baylor, has been selected by the Pew uh, Charitable Trust to join the Pew Scholars Program in bi Biomedical Sciences. She's among 22 researchers from across the country selected to join the program. Uh, this is really a very, uh, very prestigious program. It's really great. Uh, these are early career scientists that the uh, Pew uh, Fellowship supports. Her work we've talked about, I think, in, in before, but she does uh, uh, really cool work in how we sense uh, forces and change and stretch uh, in the human body uh, as part of a, a, a certain functions. Uh, the other, second one is uh, Dr. Ricardo Nuella, an associate professor of medicine at Baylor, recently released a nonfiction book called The People's Hospital that focuses on our own Bentop Hospital as a model for community involvement in, in healthcare. It's a really terrific book. Uh, this week, the New York Times listed it as one of the nine books they recommended people read, and I'm also recommending that you read it. So it's no, no the New York Times, but Dr. Klotman does, so congratulations. And the last thing, of course, is I got my copy of the Carrizo Springs Haviland, and June is a very important month because it, it is free entrance, all the citizens of Carrizo Springs, uh, to the uh, landfill. Now, this only happens once a year in June, you can only bring two loads. So if you have that refrigerator you've been trying to get rid of, now's the time to do it at Carrizo Springs. So anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.